Greetings and welcome once again to the Gaming Codex, the show where I try to explain to you all the various terms used within video games and the video games industry, and today's term is that of loot boxes, a term that's been quite popular in the past couple of weeks. According to the general definition, a loot box, sometimes called a loot crate or price crate as well as other names, is a consumable virtual item which can be redeemed to receive a randomized selection of further virtual items ranging from simple customization options for a player's avatar or character to game-changing equipment such as weapon and armor. The important thing to know is that loot boxes are not a new thing. One of the first MMOs I ever played, Voyage Century Online, had them in the year 2006, and honestly that's the general area from which they spawned, from MMOs made in Asia. I know that Asia may sound like a nebulous term, so I'm gonna narrow it down for you. China and South Korea. And these were a very specific type of MMO. Free to play MMOs in which the player could enter with no charge and enjoy themselves as much as they could until they hit a paywall, usually in the form of the fact that everybody else that spent money on the game could wipe the floor with them. And loot boxes spawned from there. They're a means through which they could sell power to the players and yet still not give them necessarily as much power as they would have wanted, but always having the allure of maybe giving you exactly what you wanted, maybe even giving you something that you did not know you wanted but would be extremely beneficial to you. It was gambling. You would pay money to get a box from the store, you'd open that box and in it you'd find something that could be useless or something that could give you all the resources you needed to complete a ship. You gotta get some premium high grade equipment, a really nifty Santa suit and many many more things. There was always a sense of anticipation of excitement when he opened one, like you get in gambling. And this was over a decade ago, and for much of that time loot boxes were confined to this kind of game. Free to play, usually MMO, in which you could sink a lot of money to get an advantage over the other players. The concept of the loot box then began to change a bit over the years. It went from you buying the actual box, or you buying the cash from the store and then using the store cash to buy the box with, you know, to sidestep the whole idea, oh, it's gambling. Well, it's not gambling if you're paying with digital currency, is it? Well, it is. I mean, you don't gamble with real money at casinos, but instead you use casino chips. So it evolved to the point where you weren't buying the box anymore. You're buying the means to open it. In this way, the developer was throwing the boxes at you. It was saying to you, hey, 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 there could be something here. There could be something in here really, really good. Open it. You want to open it. Just buy this key. It's only one dollar. It's OK. Now it's two dollars. Now it's three dollars. Buy it and you'll have an incredible reward that may actually be completely worthless. Technically, it'll always be worthless because unless you can put a monetary value on it, it is absolutely worthless. You would see this happen quite often in, well, not exactly mobile games because maybe mobile games weren't exactly up to snuff back then, but in Facebook games. And it sort of went on in this subtype of video game and later infested the sports genre which targets people that don't generally play video games but are only into sports games so therefore they are maybe a bit more easily manipulated than someone that's been playing games for a while and knows that stuff like this should not actually fly. And that's around the time when Valve came in with uh, Team Fortress 2 and its case drops. While playing the game you had a chance of receiving a random crate independently of what you were actually doing in the game and in that crate you would find an item that could be uh, aesthetic, it could be a hat and hats were very valuable back then or it could be a new weapon, one for your class, for another class 
and that weapon actually changed the way you played. Now if this were any other game, the thought of that could be a bit hard to swallow. I mean, there's a chance I'm gonna get a weapon that will change the way I play. Is that way better? Would I have more fun if I had that weapon? I don't know because I don't have that weapon and I'll not be able to get it unless I unlock crates. It's not exactly selling power unless the object within is extremely overpowered, but it is even more enticing to get it. And again, if this was any other game, it would be a problem. But Team Fortress 2 and Valve sidestepped the issue by having all items and even the crates themselves be sellable on the Steam Marketplace. So even if you had something you didn't need, didn't want, you could sell it and get the money to buy something you actually wanted. Unless it was a really, really cookie, fiery, flaming, special effecty, unusual weapon, odds are you could get pretty much any of the guns with no actual investment, monetary investment on your part. You would just be using the money you collected out of, you know, the other stuff you sold. Because why wouldn't you sell? People were buying them. The situation was even less complicated with Counter-Strike GO, where you could only get skins for weapons in the crates. That's it. They have absolutely no intrinsic value to them. At least not to the way in which they could affect the gameplay, but people did assign monetary value to them on account of their uh, rarity, on account of what they consider to be cool, and so you got knives that cost upwards of a thousand bucks. Now what is the popular definition of loot boxes? Well that would be, oh my god, not this again, I hate it, but I used to like it when it wasn't horrible. Even though Counter-Strike is one of the biggest games in the world, it still hasn't reached the mainstream, well, I would say, audience in the West on a kind of most of them play on consoles and CSGO isn't big on consoles, it's mainly a PC thing. So it didn't reach the mainstream media and the mainstream public of North America until it was implemented in a really expensively marketed game, namely Overwatch. The implementation of loot boxes in that game was completely benign. You would only get aesthetic items, things like poses, graffitis, skins for your characters, nothing that actually affected the game. Which was absolutely okay, it wasn't a problem at all, even though you couldn't actually trade the skins in case you wanted to get one that was appealing to you, but he had some that were not appealing to you. It was more of a collect them all instead of get the ones you want and then give the rest to some other player. But Blizzard had the ability to buy these crates. That's when it became a bit more nebulous. Because not only can you buy the crates, but some crates are limited into a certain period of time so they're not generally available throughout the entire year. But again, it's still something that's only cosmetic. It does not actually affect the game itself, the way it's played. Your power within the game, your chances of winning. Though to be fair, some skins do actually cause this. One good example is the um, sort of glowing lines mask that you can find on some of the SAS characters in Rainbow Six Siege. Those glowing lines absolutely make you easier to kill. I'm serious. If you're in a dark room, you will get headshotted instantly because those glowing lines are bullseye for your head. But this is more of an edge case and really no one's forcing you to wear that skin. Now if it were the other way around, then yeah, the skin would absolutely give you an advantage and that's not really something you would want in your game. And yet it was also Blizzard that made the loot boxes into an absolutely pay to win feature in one of its games, Hearthstone. Now you may say, well, Hearthstone doesn't have loot boxes, they're card packs. Every trading card game has card packs, you can always get them, even in Magic the Gathering, what's the problem? Hearthstone is not a trading card game. As was the case with Valve's implementation, Magic the Gathering is a game in which if you collect cards you do not want, you trade them with other people. The game lives on the concept of trade. Without it, it dies. It is one of its core values. The circulation of cards between players is what's keeping that game alive for over 20 years. It's what communities have been built upon. You cannot have that in a collectible card game like 
Hearthstone where there is no trade involved. In that game, if you spend a hundred bucks to get a bunch of loot boxes, a bunch of card packs, I mean, you have a really good chance of getting some of the best cards and legendaries in the latest expansion. That will absolutely give you a clear and without any sort of doubt advantage over your opponents who just got a pack or two because they don't have the money to buy as many packs or the time to grind until they get the packs they need to actually get the cards they want or the gold they need or not the gold but the dust to craft the cards they want. It's not a question of convenience it's an absolutely pay to win mechanic. Which leads us to the marketing definition of loot boxes in this extra long edition of the gaming codex. And that would be cash, 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 cash machine, but it's not gambling really, because we say so. It is gambling. It is built from the ground up to be gambling. The way in which it was implemented back in the day in those Asian MMOs, that's nothing. Companies like Blizzard have taken this idea many steps forward. They build the anticipation. We see those card packs slowly opening and breaking and exploding with light and radiance and special effects and voices and noise and bells and whistles. That is straight up slot machine design. That is straight up Las Vegas indoctrination. You are being bamboozled into thinking that you are getting something that is worth your time, your money, your effort. And the publishers are well aware of this. They designed it to be like that. They know what they are doing. They absolutely are aware of that. Even the ones that made those MMOs like Voice Engine Online absolutely knew it. It was their objective to give advantages to players that have a lot of money so they would form clicks around them with lower level players basically working for them so they would then spend money to equip those lower tier players so they would sort of spread out and form a criminal empire in a sense in terms of its structure. When it shifted to the western developers they just went the route of oh this is a $60 game let's make more money out of it but cosmetics can only get you so far so yeah let's sell power let's outright make the players have to really consciously think that they need this that they have to get this that they cannot properly play without this it's true in that shadow of war game it's true in battlefront 2 until the disabled microtransactions and a kind of people caught on it's true in every one of these games is coming out in recent weeks this is the new thing this is what they realize now is profitable something that other markets realized over a decade ago and they will absolutely ruin every part it takes of a single player or multiplayer game's progression or enjoyment in order to fill them to the brim with loot boxes. And their excuse will always be that making games is expensive and this way they can recoup the cost. Yes, making games is expensive, but you're not really in trouble of having financial difficulties in a game called Star Wars. By its sheer name, it can be an absolute crap fest like pretty much every other Star Wars game has been since probably the Force Unleashed 2 and you would still make buckets of money on them. This isn't about compensating for the uh, perceived lack of sales for the low profit margins. This is just a cash grab and you know it's a cash grab because it's being done by Electronic Arts that specializes in short term cash grabbing at the cost of of pretty much anything possible. And companies like it, which are part of the ESA, will constantly say that no, these are not gambling. But they are. They are built to be gambling. If they were not built to be gambling, then they would not be loot boxes. You would be directly able to buy the things you need, either with in-game cash or with real money. This just creates a layer of uncertainty between you and the thing you want, or the thing you think you want, so that you will have to spend money multiple times on multiple boxes 
until you actually get the thing you need. And again, because they've completely screwed up the progression of most games where they actively sell power in those crates, you do need them. But because entities like the ESRB are controlled by the ESA, which is the semi-evil conglomerate of lawyers that come from all the various major publishers in the USA and abroad, they will never admit to them being gambling, until they will be forced to admit it on account of several states and countries intervening on behalf of the people. It's not that players, you know, the gamers, is that they want the government to intercede, but Americans have an expression, screwing the pooch is what it's called, and Electronic Arts and various other big publishers have screwed the pooch so hard that it now needs medical attention. There is a limit beyond which if you go, you cannot be trusted anymore, like at all, and there is a need for oversight. And if the internal mechanisms of the industry will not do it, then someone else has to. They brought this on upon themselves. So closes this edition of the Gaming Codex. Come back next time when we will talk about a different subject, the last one of 2017. Goodbye.